giving you a voice, making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First Updates Now FRC is produced in partnership with Stryker. Discover why so many FIRST alumni and mentors are putting Stryker first when it comes to their careers. Visit careers.stryker.com forward slash FIRST to view openings, internships, and co-ops tailored to those who are in FIRST. That's careers.stryker.com forward slash FIRST. And by the Blue Alliance. Keep up to date on all live and archived FIRST Robotics events and team stats at thebluealliance.com. And also, viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun at loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Hey everyone, welcome to our last show for First Capital RE3D for 2020. I'm Ben here, and we've got some awesome robot subsystems to show you today. First, I'm going to turn it over, though, to our producer, Tyler, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about our giveaways. Yeah, we got a uh, giveaway today from Refire uh, Solutions that you can check out uh, for a quick connect with Anderson uh, power pole on here. So if you're interested in winning this a uh, little bit later on during the show, you're going to have the opportunity to put in a keyword. Uh, make sure you follow. That's how you get in. If you're interested in getting five times luck, don't forget to subscribe and do so for free through Twitch Prime or for just a few bucks a month to help keep fun, loud, live, and independent. But we are very excited to show off this incredible robot here today. Uh, don't worry, we'll have this posted to YouTube as well afterwards, but this is super cool stuff. Don't forget, tag at First Updates now in chat. If you have any questions, Heather will be fielding those and grabbing those for us so we can uh, put those in. So once again, at First Updates now, should you have any questions, Lots of cool stuff that take place here. We'll turn it back over to the RA3D team. All right, cool. Thanks, Tyler. Um, so first, I'm going to call up Eric and Sarah up here, and we're going to talk a little bit about our strategy and design intent for this robot. I'll turn it over to you guys to start. Hi, I'm Eric Drost. I'm a mentor for FRC 1923. And I'm Sarah Jotti, also a mentor for FRC 1923. Um, so the first thing uh, I would like to talk about is just what we sort of our intent in building this robot and what we want to what we wanted to do for the community via this this endeavor um, basically as you can see we built a fairly com complete robot um, and as if you're following along on our progress throughout the uh, past couple days you can see you know our intent was to build a complete functional robot but ultimately the most important thing is to show teams how you could approach these challenges what works what doesn't um, and kind of give you guys a kickstart on some of your prototyping as you guys are making your own strategic choices. Um, so, you know, one of the big things that we emphasize in a six week build, uh, especially on 1923, I know many other teams as well, is systems integration. And um, what, that, what I mean by that, for those of you that might not be familiar, is the way the different subsystems fit together into a robot as a cohesive, thought out package. Um, something that, you know, uh, whether you have space constraints or weight constraints, how everything fits together so everything plays nice, basically. And that's not something we gave much thought to on this build, um, not because it's not important, but because we wanted to, in three days, you know, there's not much time to sit down and do a whole lot of CAD before you build, stuff like that. Uh, so we really just want to, I, I want to point out that this robot, um, and I think Eric's going to uh, emphasize this a little bit more, but this robot with a little bit more time and CAD effort and pre-planning could be packaged a lot better uh, than what you see here. Our goal here was basically not to get in each other's way uh, the different subsystems. Yeah, so um, basically we wanted to create a robot with all the functionality. However, if we could have had more time to package it, uh, we could have made each little bit of functionality a little bit better. Um, here are some examples uh, for our climber. Right now we are on a hook design, which we'll show you a little bit later. But if you've been following along with us, you know that we have an auto balancing uh, wheel that you can climb from that you can drive back and forth on the bar. Um, that was one of the first things that we actually had to cut. We intended to have it on the robot, but um, just because the shooter's here and the we could not get the drive for the elevator down below because then it would uh, interfere with our belting system. Uh, that was one of the first things we had to cut just for, for space reasons. Um, another thing that we wanted to add, but pack it like getting the robot done and functional just to show you guys every game function being completed uh, we thought it would be nice to have a turreted shooter um, 
there's just no way we were going to be able to package it with that extent. Other features that might have been good if we had more time to design around a robot that had all the features in a different shape, we could have potentially either fit under the low bar or maybe 75% under the low bar with enough reach to grab the extra two balls behind it in autonomous mode. Um, but basically the point of what we were doing is we wanted to do all the challenges to give you a good comparison and contrast for how hard each part of the game was. And we were actually quite surprised by which parts were hard and which parts were easy. Uh, um, the, the balls make this game um, quite different than what we were intuitively expecting. They are very, very sticky with each other. They compress in weird ways, and if you put them through a roller system in the wrong way, they can pancake down to like one inch thick. Um, I, I believe this is the hardest game piece we've seen in at least 10 years to, to handle. Um, sure. 100%. And, uh, and especially because it's a uh, you have to interact with multiple of them, it's a similar game piece to what we saw in 2016 Stronghold with the boulder. Uh, there are two kind of major differences in this challenge is this is a stickier skin. This is dino skin of the ball. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a bunch of these kind of uh, same, same manufacturer, but this is called elephant skin. Totally different behavior, totally different ball interaction. Um, so it's, it's, this is a very, very hard game piece to deal with. Um, and on that note, I'd like to emphasize, we bought these uh, elephant skin balls off of Amazon. I think they were a little bit cheaper than the official first game pieces that you can purchase from Andy Mark. Please, if, if at all possible, and you plan on manipulating more than one of these balls at a time, uh, please buy the official game pieces, at least two of them, so you can understand what we're talking about yourselves and decide and make an informed decision if you need to purchase more. It, it would really be a shame to show up to your first competition and have your robot jam up because the balls are stickier than, than you anticipated, and we don't, we don't want to see that. Yeah, it's worth noting they shoot slightly different too, so it, it's all around it. They look the same to human eye, but they're very different. So basically, uh, our encouragement here is you really prototype everything to do with balls. Um, you know, stuff like the climber here, um, you know, stuff doesn't normally work on the first time. The climber worked pretty much on the first time. Um, the color wheel was the first or second try. It was pretty quick. The, the ball side of things, that was a lot of work. Balls are hard. Make sure you prototype your ball stuff. Um, and ev yeah. even, the, even the shooter, uh, the configuration that we have it in, we needed to tune variables in the shooter, but the configuration of the shooter was like close to perfect first yeah. try too, and we just needed to tune for compression, RPM, things like that. Anyway, that's quite a lot of on systems integration stuff. Just want to make sure that some of that strategic overall contents out there. Um, our robot is way too top heavy. Do not design this robot just as it is. Make sure you put more effort into packaging than we do. Any final thoughts, guys? Yeah, yeah. I think that covered it. It's a complete picture, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Um, do do we want to take any overall strategy questions, Tyler? Um, let's go into some subsystems first, and then we'll grab some All questions right. in a little bit. Sounds good. Okay, I'm going to call the drive team up, and we can look a little bit at what we've got going on in our drive. Hi, I'm Michaela, uh, alumni of TechFire 225. And my name is Arnold. I'm an alumni of FRC 303. We're going to take a look at our drive base here. We have four six-inch wheels on each side for eight wheels in total. We have the uh, West Coast, or, sorry, the Vex Pro uh, West Coast drive bearing blocks here that allows us to tension this chain really nicely. That also gives us a 1 8 inch drop center to allow us to uh, turn pretty well. Um, we have bearings in these uh, Vex Pro West Coast Drive bearing blocks and these gussets. Those are both donated by ThriftyBot. Um, and overall, this is a pretty standard West Coast Drive. It's pretty robust. It has served all of our purposes pretty well. And Michaela's going to talk to you about why we made some of these design decisions. So we went with an eight-wheel drive with that drop center um, for two large reasons. One reason we went with eight wheels was so that, so when you have six wheels, your robot can rock back and forth between the front and the back. With eight wheels, your robot stays pretty centered on the two wheels in the middle, which keeps us more stable for shooting. We also picked eight wheels and the larger wheels so that we could get over the berm easily and be able to turn on it. So that was not an issue for us in the fact that we're not going under the color wheel. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we would have no issues getting across the field. Um, 
Yeah, that's pretty much it for the drive base. We're going to demo the camera. Yeah. Shift the camera backed up a little bit. You're going to be able to see we clear really, really easily. At any angle, we're not going to get stuck. If we happen to stop on the beam, um, it's very easy for us to turn on it as well. And it's possible to do this with the smaller wheels or a six-wheel drive base, but with the eight larger wheels, it's guaranteed we're very easily not going to get stuck. Do we have any questions? Uh, yeah, we had one question come in from Blue Defender. Uh, says, do you think teams with four-inch traction wheels using West Coast Ride would have an issue going over the bump? Four-inch traction wheels? Four. Oh, four. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really depends on how you position your first wheel. If you're running your drive rail flat into the side of the berm, then you're going to have real trouble uh, in that particular situation. So you could do it with four-inch wheels. You just have to put in your thought and your wheel placement. All right, next question uh, coming in from Azatot says, uh, have any experiments been done with the Omni wheels in the berm? So we didn't end up putting Omni wheels on our robot. It was an option or it was a, an idea in our heads. It, we were thinking more about Omni wheels if we were gonna get stuck turning. And so we ended up not having issues with that. So we never switched them out into Omni. So I don't think we can't speak from experience with from it, um, but it, it seems like mostly the middle wheels are touching the berm when we're turning, so I don't know if it would be an issue or not. Uh, just a follow-up comment that I just want to read off from uh, MRA190, uh, who just wants to add on to the traction wheel, says, uh, four-inch traction is rough. If you have a belly plan or rivets under your robot, it's hard to get over it at slow speed, uh, and they tried it yesterday. So other teams trying this as well, too, so uh, keep that in mind. All right, cool. Um, so I'm going to call up the intake team, and we're going to talk a lot about the major changes that have happened over the last couple days. Hey, guys. So we're going to talk about the intake team. Uh, I've got a couple of other uh, people who've worked with me on this subsystem here. I'm Richard. I'm an alumni and mentor of TechFire 225. I'm Michaela. I'm an alumni of Team 365. All right, so we ended up working with a couple different designs over the course of the three days, depending on whether, how it needed to be integrated to the, the indexing subsystem. As for our final design, we went to the ThriftyBot vectored intake, the vectored wheels for the intake to pull towards the center, since we needed all the balls in a line for the indexing system. The center, we used Anti-Mark Omnis, the gray ones because they allowed for more slip to allow the ball to center better, and these green ones actually gripped it a little bit better than these and pulled it towards the center. Yeah, so for those of you that have been following our progress over the past couple of days, you might remember um, yesterday we were having quite a bit of difficulty with uh, getting Originally, we had a uh, poly belt roller here leading um, leading back, and we were having quite a bit of difficulty getting that to uh, center properly and stay tracked, even on a crown roller. Uh, what we ended up doing, actually, at about 5 a.m. this morning, before we went home for the day and came back, we decided that that was just not going to be something that we could get working in the limited time we have. Not to say that a similar solution couldn't work if we had more time to machine more precision parts, but what we ended up doing was sort of going with the brute force method, and we ended up building a kind of a hot dog roller system here, if you look under here, and it's basically um, just a bunch of churro tubes uh, all on live axles, uh, all acting as live axles, rather, uh, chained together with little short chain runs running down the length of the intake bar powered by this one Neo 550 uh, going into this uh, planetary gearbox. And um, we just put a bunch of baby flex wheels on there. I think they're like the 1.625 uh, diameter uh, 40 durometer flex wheels. And uh, that, that works great now. It pulls the ball in, doesn't get jammed, doesn't slip. Um, seems to be working pretty well for us. Uh, I would I would go out on a limb and say the intake subsystem is going to be one of the ones you guys have the most trouble with. Um, w I know we did for sure, and that's something that we're going to take back to our respective teams and and uh, really emphasize in prototyping is to make sure we have a bulletproof intake. If you can't pick up the game pieces, you can't really play the game. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna make sure that's high priority for us. 
uh, and we encourage you guys to take a look at that as well. Um, so we'll go ahead and demonstrate uh, in taking some balls. Now, one thing that's worth noting is, unfortunately, because we were kind of doing this in a rush, uh, the interaction between the outside vectored wheels and this inside one is not great. The ball tends to stick up in here and in here. We found that we can mitigate that just by having the drivers wiggle the robot a little bit to get the ball to pass past that sticky point and uh, and and into the uh, robot. So first we'll start off rolling one in right up the center. Now we'll do one from the side. And you see it gets stuck there, so the uh, driver's just going to wiggle the robot a little bit. And same thing on the other side. So as you can see, that, that provides a nice smooth interface for us to uh, get the balls up into the indexing subsystem, which we'll talk about in a, in a, in a couple minutes here. Um, and then just to get the, get the intake inside frame peri perimeter, we have a, a single pneumatic cylinder. Um, unfortunately, with the time constraint and making some last minute changes, it doesn't quite get all the way up. Uh, but I'm confident that for anyone who does a similar design, a little bit more thought, a little bit more planning in CAD or uh, even on paper, and that should not be an issue at all. Any questions yeah, for the intake team, Yeah, quite a few questions uh, for the uh, intake on here. So starting out uh, with uh, Lord Waffle, do you mind going over the orange belting once again on the intake? Um, sure. So the orange belting, uh, originally what you see up here, uh, up in the indexing subsystem, we had a run of that from basically where this green omni is back to where the uh, – um, ball enters the the rest of the subsystem. The thought there was we well, one thing you want to emphasize when you're designing a ball transport system like this is not to have dead zones. And by dead zone, I mean uh, in any area in your robot where there's not an, something actively moving the ball forward. You don't want to rely on something another ball coming in behind to push the ball through. Um, basically, you don't want a place where a ball can get stuck in your system and and not be able to be either shot out or out the way it came or back forward up into your system. Um, so the problem we had with the belting is that uh, just with the machining resources we had and the time we had here, we weren't able to get a, a good enough center to center and uh, make the belt tight enough for it to track properly. We had some problems where sometimes when the ball would be coming in from the side, it would cause it would jam up with the belt and cause it to ride off its its, its roller, um, and and ultimately that was just causing us a lot of problems. We we went through about 15 or 20 iterations just in the period of time from midnight last night through uh, through 5 a.m. this morning when we left. And that's when we made the decision to just uh, scrap it, make some parts on the mill, put in the time to get some precise center to centers and just, just call it a day and sort of throw some brute force at it. I think Eric's got a little bit more to add here. Yeah, I, I just have one comment on the intake belting um, it can certainly work uh, we were having a lot of trouble getting it to work you can definitely make it work our recommendation to you would be if you are doing an intake belt like a, an orange belt right here like here to here um, don't put it on your front roller have your foremost roller just be like your vectoring stuff and then your belt can be on a, a roller right behind it and that is because uh, while you're vectoring the wheels if you're putting side loads on these belts, they really like to come off track. So maybe have a vectoring system ahead of the belt, and then when the belt is in contact with the ball, it's already centered. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. All right, we do have quite a few questions. Might need to go just a little bit faster on uh, answers for this. So sure. uh, Do 100 says, uh, for the intake, is the conveyor and intake using the same motor to manipulate the power cell? No, so real quick, we have uh, three separate motors here controlling uh, the ball path. Actually, uh, four separate sets of motors controlling the ball path through the robot. We've got one on the intake that brings the ball from, the, from outside the robot to right about here where it enters the orange belts. We've got these two motors here running it up to, up to this point here. These rollers are run on their own uh, mini Neo, uh, Neo 550 on the other side through a uh, Rev Ultra Planetary gearbox. And then finally, we have our shooter, which ejects the balls at the front of the robot running on two Rev Neo motors. So four separate uh, actuators to get the ball up and through the robot. All right, next question uh, coming in uh, from M. Ray. M. Ray, sorry, sorry, Michael. Uh, originally, you guys had problems with the balls jamming. Did that get fixed or just going to not pick up two at the same time? Was that the solution? 
Um, we're gonna we're gonna do a little bit more uh, in depth uh, testing and footage capture when we when we uh, film some reveal video stuff a little bit later. Uh, we haven't had a lot of time to test it out. It seems like on first pass, if if one ball hits the roller, the roller actually pops up and doesn't really interact with the second ball until the first one's in. So we're gonna we're gonna confirm that for you guys. But it seems like we're we're just gonna rely on uh, driver intuition and 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 uh, if if the intake jams, just ejecting and re re attempting to acquire the ball. Hey, chat, just want to point out, by the way, if you're interested in voting for the name of the robot, there is a link on there to a straw poll. You can go ahead and vote. Uh, we have narrowed it down to three, and whatever the internet chooses is what we're going with. So go ahead and vote uh, for that so we can name the robot. Uh, next question coming in uh, from Furry Hippo, because why not? Uh, how did you decide on whether to go through a hole in the bumper rather than a solid bumper all the way around? How does it interact with the human player station and also in regards to the intake pickup? So we were able to, originally we were doing where there was no cutout when we were pulling into a hopper. It really depended on what the indexing system was, where we were pulling it to. It just worked better that centering it worked better with having the vectored wheels have a back plate and then they were pulling it into something. If you were pulling it just all into the robot, we were able to get, in one of our previous videos, it to pull over the bumper just fine if that's what your team wants to go with. All right, next question coming in from Engineer at 5813. Do the flex wheels actually contact the ball on the intake? Um, so we originally had them much closer together and they're not constrained on the shaft significantly. Uh, so we just let it run a couple times and they settle to wherever it's happy. Uh, I would say that w depending on at which point in the intake track the ball is, for example, coming right over this lip, there's a lot of compression. I would say that's one point where the flex wheels are making slight tangential contact, but certainly to your point, uh, there, there, there are areas in the intake where it might just be rolling on the churro tube. Uh, this was just thrown together this morning and not much engineering analysis has gone into it yet. Um, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll check that out later and maybe up, give you guys an update. Um, I know a couple people kind of answered their or gave their opinions in chat, but uh, Pickett Zergas, how does the ball-to-ball -ball stickiness compare to the 2012 Rebound Rumble ball? Uh, one of you guys want to? The ball-to-ball the -ball stickiness is greater than it is in Rebound Rumble. It's, it's more like what it was in Stronghold, which is pretty bad. All right, next question coming in from Atlu13. What is the distance between the vector wheels on the intake? Uh, so these outside wheels are spaced out one inch, um, and then the inside ones are spaced out one inch as well. This gap, unfortunately, was a little bit too big, but we there was not much we could do about that. Um, we found that one inch spacing works works pretty well, as you guys saw. Uh, as the top asking, would they be willing to characterize a new intake as a midnight invention? Um, I'd like to say I'd like to actually point out that there was a. I actually had very little little input in this, so I, I think I think there's a credit goes to these guys more so than me. I just kind of uh, gave my stupid opinions, and sometimes they listened, sometimes they didn't, and most of the times none of my ideas worked anyway. So, no, it's a midnight failure, honestly. Uh, it didn't it didn't work at midnight. It worked at 8 a.m. this morning. All right, last question here uh, for the intake team uh, from Thino TV says: Any reductions in the planetaries, or are they all one to one? Uh, sorry, I should have I should have mentioned that. That's a great question. Uh, we have the um, in the in, in the intake specifically. We can talk about the rest of it later. Uh, this planetary gearbox is geared for 15 to one with a Neo 550. Um, we found that that gives us a good balance between torque and speed with the two inch wheels uh, to pull the ball in. It does put the ball under heavy compression in some areas, so that that torque is needed. We did run one at uh, seven to one yesterday and had some issues with motor stall and and and. Uh, um, so we decided to uh, swap, swap to a 15 to 1. All right, I think that's going to be it from our uh, intake team. we got a couple more teams coming up here. Uh, but before we do that, I do want to give a big shout-out and thank you to our sponsors of fun. That is Stryker, S-T-R-Y-K-E-R. Stryker is a leading medical technology company that is here for you. They are interested in people who are in first, who are looking for co-ops, internships, or just high-paying careers. Uh, people who actually support people who are in first. So if you're in first and you want a company that actually supports you being in first, go check out careers dot s t r y k e r dot com forward slash first to find out first careers located all over for you once again careers dot s t r y k e r dot com forward slash first to learn more tyler okay now i'm going to turn it over to the indexing subsystem 
So you folks want to come up here? Hello, I'm David, uh, alumni of TechFire225. Hello, uh, my name is Ravi. I'm an alumni of Team 219 and Mentor 6943. I'm Andrew. I'm an uh, alumni and mentor of Team 225. Okay, uh, so taking a look at the indexing uh, mechanism here, uh, it's basically this whole run that connects uh, down here from the intake up right before the sh uh, shooter here. So uh, this is using the 2x1 extrusion, uh, bearings running through, and uh, a polyurethane belt uh, run to lift the balls up. Uh, we have some hard stealth wheels, sometimes 2-inch uh, compliant wheels here on the edges, uh, and then a slightly larger 2 and a quarter inch compliant wheel in the middle to create a bit of a crown. Uh, that way the belt remains centered, so uh, the high point on the pulley keeps it centered. We have two motors, uh, the two 775s driving here through uh, a reduction here, um, uh, driving the first bottom half of the indexer. And uh, over here on the back, um, running the top stage, we have a small Rev Neo 550 running through the Rev Ultra Planetary gearboxes, driving this. Um, so. I'll uh, hand it on over to Andrew here to talk about uh, the control systems involved with this. Uh, sure. So uh, one of the things we wanted to do from the start was um, automatically index these balls uh, so the operator doesn't have to really worry about figuring out which motors to run. Um, we put two of these uh, plating with fusion uh, time of flight sensors at the bottom. Um, if you're not familiar with them, basically they uh, bounce a, la a laser off uh, in one direction and, and tell you how far away uh, something is in front of the sensor. Um, we're just using them as basically like a Boolean, is there a ball there or not? Um, so when we're intaking, we run these bottom rollers uh, until a ball comes in to about here where the second sensor is. Um, and then we uh, just run uh, both stages until we don't see the ball anymore. Um, we had some issues with uh, the the rate of these um, kind of causing gaps, uh, so we added a uh, a small like half a second uh, pulse backwards on the top uh, segment here to prevent the ball from getting stuck in the shooter. Um, given more time, uh, it would be nice to have more sensors throughout the the robot or uh, use the encoder. Uh, we actually have a hex encoder on the the shaft here, but. Um, from the software perspective, we uh, got the the completed intake uh, system this morning. So, um, but it, it works very well for such a, a simple and quick implementation. Um, I think. Uh, yes. So, uh, if you guys have been following along, uh, we went through several designs for the indexer. So, one of the designs that we previewed uh, earlier uh, in this build was a mechanum serializer. Um, and one of the big problems that we found, not um, overall, that has been stressed uh, quite a lot, is that uh, the balls behave very uh, differently under compression. So as you can see, these polycord uh, uh, intake and indexer uh, tries to keep contact with the balls along the entire run. Um, because we generally found that if you're not contacting the power cell, that it tends to squeeze or compress and jam and we encourage teams to take this into effect when designing their robots. Hi, uh, so one of the most critical parts about subsystems like this is that you are transmitting power on two sides of the ball. Um, for example, if we had this belt run here and here on the front and on the back, it was just like a flat Lexan plate, this system would not work at all. Um, this is because of the way the balls interact with each other. They do not like to roll when they're touching. Um, so what we do to solve that problem is we are transmitting power on the front side and on the back side. So that way the balls are not rolling when they're moving through the robot. They're staying in the same orientation. That way if they're touching, uh, it's, it's not that big of an issue because we're just transporting a, a long ball caterpillar through the robot instead of five independent rotating balls. I just had one question uh, real quick that I just want to ask from the chat. Uh, from Blue Defender, would a seatbelt work for the conveyor? Uh, 
So with our testing, we tried a few different materials. Um, probably the most similar one we found was uh, using a piece of uh, soft side Velcro on the intake. Uh, we found that the polyurethane belts have the best grip on these balls. Uh, I'm not sure how well a seat belt would work because uh, the uh, surface might be a bit too slick, but it's definitely worth trying. I think uh, it's time for us to demo. We can put two more balls in the indexer and show how that works. We've already indexed three. Just put two more in. Yeah, it's sometimes uh, with the fifth ball we have to be a little bit careful and the operator has to pop it in reverse for a second, but it actually looks like uh, we're fine. <laughs> All right. So, um, Tyler, were there any more, there weren't any more questions on the indexer, right? No. All right. So with that, I'm going to bring the shooter team up and we're going to talk uh, about that part of the, part of the robot, that plus our vision tracking. Hello, I'm Audrey. I'm an alum of FRC Team 20, and I currently help with scouting and strategy on FRC 5254. Hi, I'm Andrew again, uh, alumni mentor of Team 225. Here to talk about the flywheel subsystem here. So this is just a mechanical rundown of it, but we're going to start with the motors. We're powering two NEOs on each side, and they're both at a one-to-one -one gear ratio, so we can get a lot of power through this thing. We're using the Fairline, Fairline wheels from McMaster. They are four inches in diameter, and we also have a two pound flywheel on the edge here, so we can maintain rotational inertia as we're shooting all five balls in succession with each other. We've got a hood here that's at about a 25 degree angle, and it has about an inch and a quarter of compression on it. Um, past that, uh, we feed the balls in consistently through the bottom, so we get an even shot each time. And as we've progressed through this process, we've kind of had the same shooter design for most of it. It's pretty easy to just pop it on and then change the compression and change whatever variables we needed with this setup. Um, so yeah, and now here's talk about controls. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so for the control side, uh, we're running a PID loop on the shooter um, using the built-in encoders on the Neo. Um, with end with the built-in control on the uh, Spark Maxes. Uh, one of the nice things about the Spark Maxes, um, besides the fact that all the encoder stuff is just integrated with the motor already, um, you can tune these over USB-C, um, so you, you and you can graph the output there. Um, and uh, th this was actually our first time using uh, the built-in control on the the uh, Spark Maxes, and it was pretty painless to get going. Um, for the vision here, we have a limelight. Um, also, our first time on 225 using a limelight, uh, and I think this is what we'll be using for the future with vision, just because it's uh, ridiculously easy to get going without uh, much custom work at all, um, which is really nice exp when you don't have a lot of time to uh, touch the robot, like in RA3D. Um, and uh, on the the uh, control side for that, it's just a proportional control loop running directly on the uh, the output uh, angle air from the uh, that the limelight is publishing through network tables. Right. Do we want to do a demo? All right. All right. So we're going to shoot all five. And there they go. So it's pretty fast. Um, get all five off in about a second there, under a second maybe. Yeah, so do we have any questions on the shooter? Yeah, uh, a few coming in uh, from uh, Spring 13. Uh, what were the limelight testing results for longer distance shooting? Um, we. What what uh, I do you know what distance this is yeah, about? about? Twenty feet back there. All right, yeah, yeah. So we we uh, we were able to test about twenty feet back here. Um, I see someone else uh, asked, is the limelight off center being an issue? Um, and you could uh, adjust for that. We we don't right now, so um, it uh, it really only works from one distance, uh, just because we aren't aren't really uh, doing anything, just using the raw values right now. Um, if we had more time, we would uh, clean that stuff up, but... Um. 
All right, next question coming in uh, from PH Wog. How hot do the motors get when spinning? Not really. Safety first. All right. Uh, <laughs> next up from Engineer5813. How come? How did you come up with the inch and a quarter of compression on the power cells? So we actually spent a bit of time tuning the shooter. Um, we inserted foam that was about three and eighths thick and came up with this as our ideal shooting location. We do have, I think, a video on the tuning of the shooter, so um, that's on the internet. You can go watch that on the YouTube channel. Yeah, I want to point out too, um, even though like we're right here, our shooting band is probably about 10 to 12 feet of space. So just because we're positioned uh, right here and shooting from here, we can shoot from a few feet back and side to side as well. Um, that does answer a couple questions, and Amri had just asked a question about how precise it is. Uh, we do have a video, by the way. Uh, we, there's a Twitch clip of it. You can check it out at, on our Discord as well, too, of us uh, draining five into the inner port in a row. Uh, so is it 100% no, but can it be 100%? Sure. So interesting things with that. Just one thing to add with that. We're just running the shooter at a, a constant RPM right now. Um, if we had more time, we could adjust the speed dynamically from the limelight, uh, and that would help us just be able to pull up and, and shoot without having to worry about being precisely uh, aligned. All right, awesome. Cool, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and bring up the color wheel team and we'll talk about this part of the robot. Uh, and just to mention, uh, chat, uh, we do wanna probably have a hard out at 30 after the hour so we might not get to all questions as we have a lot to clean up. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you post in the Chief Delphi thread, that we have for that. We'll try to answer any additional questions, or you can post in Fun's Discord uh, for that as well. And we will be starting our giveaway after our next segment here. All right, I'm gonna hand this over to the Color Wheel team. Yeah. So, hi, I'm Samantha, alumni and mentor of Team 3081, the Robo Eagles. I'm Andrew, uh, alumni and mentor of 225. Yeah, so here is our uh, uh, control panel manipulator. Um, so it's right here on the robot. So what we have is a Neo 550 to a Versa Planetary and a compliant wheel from Andy Mark. And then we have a bracket sticking out here with a Rev V3 color sensor looking down to sense the colors. Um, that is mounted on a arm. So it's got a pivot point here um, and here to the top of a seven inch pneumatic cylinder and also to the bottom. So, oh, this is pressurized so I can't move it right now, but when we extend the cylinder, it goes um, pretty straight out. Um, so then our strategy is to run along the side of the field. So we line up to the exact same spot on the color wheel. So we know we're sensing at the same spot. Um, so that is consistent. And then our color wheel will be here. We'll bring the arm back down and that will put pressure on this and then we can spin it. We're going to try and uh, pull the robot up here. Um, so for rotating it to position here, if we can hit that. Yeah. yeah. So this is a, a Neo 550, which uh, just like the, the bigger Neos has a built-in encoder, which we're just using it to run at about 3.5 revolutions. Um, um, yeah, and, and if you can hit the color wheel. And then we have a, uh, a rev uh, color sensor there, which we're using um, to, right now it's uh, looking for green, so the FMS would uh, see yellow. And we just run it at a slower speed uh, until we see a color and then stop. Um, we do run it over a little bit because otherwise it, it would detect it right on the edge. Um, there's not any, it's not really any lag. Um, so this is us intentionally kind of bringing it to the middle. Um, one of the, the nice things about using the encoder for the, uh, the 3.5 revolution uh, run is that we can run it a lot faster and not worry about missing uh, colors. Um, I think, uh, do you have anything else to add? Uh, yep. Yeah, uh, no, uh, okay. <laughs> That's it for the uh, color thing. All right, any questions for our color wheel team? Uh, not for the color wheel team, but we are going to start our uh, giveaway uh, for today while we set up for awesome. our next thing. So we will do, by the way, a couple things. We still have, uh, I think, one or two more uh, processes to show. Uh, and then 
Uh, we're going to kind of show everything all together. So show the uh, power cells being intaked, uh, an index, and then shot as well too. So we'll try to show you this completion process that we have uh, through this as well. Uh, so with that said, we are going to start, as I mentioned, our giveaway from our friends here uh, at Refire Solutions for the Refire Quick Connect Anderson Power Pole. So if you're interested in winning this from our friends at Refire Solutions, all you have to do is make sure you click that follow button up there. That's your chance to get in and type in the keyword Quick Connect. So Quick Connect is what allows you to get entered into this. If you do choose to subscribe, help fund stay live live and independent, you will get five times luck to win. So good luck, everybody. And let's continue on this amazing robot reveal. Use one of those on our Skywalker device, Tyler. It's an awesome device, and it's only five bucks, so it doesn't count on your bill of materials. All right, so climber team, we're going to go ahead and drive the robot over here to our bar, and they're going to demo and take questions about our climber device. So go ahead, come over here, guys, and I'll hand you the microphone, and you could start talking about what we've got going on here. Hey, hey, guys. My name, my name is. Yeah, slight technical difficulties. We're checking the wiring real quick. Oh, looks like we might have have uh, a little bit of technical difficulties here. Um, all right, why don't you guys come over here and we'll talk about the Skywalker device while we figure out what's going on with the robot. All right. So I'm Masi. I am an alumni of FRC Team 7 Parallel Universe. My name is Pranav. I'm an alumni and mentor of 6880 Universal Serial Brawlers. Uh, hi, I'm Lucas. I'm a mentor on 5813 Morpheus. All right, and we're here to, while they fix the actual robot, to talk to you about one of our prototype mechanisms, which did not make it on the, the final robot, which we dubbed the Skywalker. Um, this is a mechanism that allows us to securely grip onto the climbing bar and also shift our robot from side to side in order to achieve balance points with another team. Um, this robot did not, this mechanism did not make it on the final robot due to space constraints with integration and time constraints with get, getting everything to work right in this 3D time frame. Additionally, if you can see, we have a hook on it if you've been keeping track. That is a mechanism that we wanted to demonstrate for other teams to draw inspiration from. So we do a quick demonstration of how this thing slides back and forth. Let me get on this thing real quick. Okay. Yeah, so as you can see, it works really well uh, for moving weight along the bar. Um, this is definitely a very viable. This is definitely a very viable um, mechanism for teams to use. Um, you can also notice that when we were going up and down a bar, it tracks pretty well um, on the bar. So even with a little bit of swing, it'll still stay on. Yep. And now it looks like our robot is just about being reset. Oh, okay, it's just being reset. So in a minute, we will take you to the actual climb. Just give us a brief moment. I, I just want to reiterate that that is a fully functional mechanism. We have a couple of videos on our YouTube channel about it working. Um, the reason it's not on the robot is, is basically strictly packaging. Um, it's, it was not possible based on where the power transmission for the elevator that we're using to climb is and, and where the shooter hood ended up being. Uh, it, there just wasn't enough space. The, the mechanism works just fine. Um, your team is going to have to decide for your own if you, there's a strategic need for your robot to have this mechanism, but it, it works perfectly. Hey Eric, just a question we had uh, come in from Dark's Axis. The drill that you're using, how does how does that whole thing work with the wires coming out? Can you explain that a bit more? Okay, so um, Techfire uh, showed 1923 how to do it, so 1923 has one too. Uh, basically, from from here up is a drill. Um, in the back of a drill, it's basically just two wires for power uh, to, in our drill when we did it, it looked a lot like a 775 Pro motor. Uh, basically, we took from the 775 Pro quote motor uh, here off and just used the power wires and then put them into Anderson poles. And the one thing to be concerned about, or not concerned about, but to be careful about, is this is a 20 volt battery. So uh, the trigger is, is variable voltage, so you may not want to pull the trigger all the way down and, and nuke your motors, but uh, you can squeeze the trigger and it will give you variable voltage. Mm -hmm. 
you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a very useful tool for prototyping, especially when you're working with brushed motors. Um, and we're going to bring the robot in now. Uh, while the robot comes in, I want to just talk about um, what happened so everyone knows. So this is a little 20 amp fuse out of the PDP. This is actually the second one we broke in these, and uh, we broke one last night too. So we've got some sort of electrical gremlin in the robot that we're not sure what it is. Um, clearly this is not a perfect robot, we're working on it, um, and I'm going to hand it over to these guys. All right, so I'm going to start off talking about um, the structure of the elevator. So as you can see, we're using um, the AndyMark 2x1x1 by by inch tubing, uh, which was donated to us um, by AndyMarks, thank you for that. Um, that's our uh, frame, and we're actually using the rev lift kit for the actual, uh, for the bearings. Um, sorry, I mean uh, Bex, uh, VEX lift kit and um, so this is a chain driven um, lift you can see that we riveted down the chain to the first stage um, and this is also a one stage lift so we get about 26 inches of extension um, and if we go all the way up it goes up to about 71 inches just with the lift alone with an additional nine inches with the hook um, the elevator is driven by two neos on the bottom one on each side um, and there's a 40 to 1 reduction in the gearbox plus an additional 3 to 1 reduction outside um, with the gears, so a total of 120 to 1 reduction. Um, yeah, and now I'll hand it off to Luke to talk about our braking. Yep, so uh, over here we have a pneumatic brake cylinder because at the end of the match all power will be cut from the motor, so this could just directly fall but the climb score is measured five seconds after the end of the match, so we need a way to stay up to be able to get those climb points. So this pneumatic cylinder just shoves into the uh, hex shaft, uh, causing the, the shaft to be able to not spin. Yep. And the one last bit I'm going to talk to you about right now is our hook design. Um, in order to fit all of this like or complexity into the height limit, we decided to go with a an unfolding hook design. And if you could take it down here, there is a bolt which normally ho which holds the hook into place during normal match play. And at, when we want to climb, the elevator is brought up, causing the hook to bend down a little bit, creating enough clearance for the th for the hook to then spring up past the bolt, enabling us to take a climb position. This is also able to rotate a little bit, giving us a little bit of leeway if the bar is at an alternate angle to still climb effectively. All right, and I guess we'll do a quick demonstration. Yeah, so you can see that we actually, um, because of the fact that we mounted the hook and everything above almost the exact center of gravity, there really is no swing um, forward and backwards with the robot. And even though there's a little bit of swing because it's tilted um, side to side, that's not really affecting it much. Um, you can see in some of our YouTube videos about um, how we troubleshooted a little bit of a sliding here, with, uh, we put some grip tape on, but, yeah. Great! Yeah, yeah it I, looks like... hear an air leak, yeah. Yeah, it looks like we have a bit of an air leak, so the brake isn't working fully um, all the way, but you can see in some of our previous videos that the brake works really well as well. All right, all right any questions for the climber team? I just have uh, one qu one question to go through real quick. Uh, did you guys consider a buddy climb at all when coming up with concepts? This is something we thought about when we were doing our initial prototypes, but we quickly realized that creating a buddy climb system would have been a bit too complicated of a problem to tackle in this short three-day period, in addition to all the other integration that we have to do. There's not a lot of space on the robot to have a buddy climb. But with better integration over a six week plus build season, you can definitely have a buddy climb and have it be a viable strategy for the season. And one thing to add on with the uh, brake mechanism, obviously ours with the air leak wasn't working quite as well as we hoped. There are multiple off the shelf brake mechanisms that you can buy. I know Vex just released their uh, pneumatic brake on their website and there are also just multiple custom ways you can do it. So don't be limited just by what we did. Worth noting, we also would have hung for the five seconds, so it would have been fine uh, from a legality standpoint and counter for points. Any further questions, Tyler? All right, we're going to go ahead and move the robot back. Um, while we do that, uh, I'm going to, I need to 
make sure and give a very hearty thank you to the First Capital RI3D sponsors. We have Rev Robotics, Andy Mark, Thrifty Bots, Playing with Fusion, Refire Solutions, our host Coupling Corporation of America, Tech Fire, both for parents and food and uh, use of all the parts. Um, yeah, so couldn't have done it without all of you. It's been a fantastic build. And thanks also to all the different team members and First Updates Now for coming out to uh, do this with us. It's been a fantastic time. I think this robot blows last year's out of the water. It's pretty, pretty great. It has a lot of subsystems, and I think it's going to be very helpful for teams. Um, Anything to add, Tyler, before we do a demo? Uh, no, I think we should show a full demo of this. Don't forget the uh, giveaway is still up right now if you're interested in winning. Quick Connect is the keyword. We're going to draw for that uh, after this last demo. Um, I know there are a couple of outstanding questions. I think at this time we're going to need to probably wrap up. Uh, so we apologize about that, but uh, post in our Discord mm -hmm. uh, if you want to or in the CD thread, and we'll get to those afterwards. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and boot up the robot here, and we'll go chase – oh. We have, uh, we have a little bit of a delay. All right, so let's go ahead, pick up some balls, pick up five, and put them in the goal. One more time, guys. All right, fantastic job, team. I think it's time to wrap up, Tyler. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that uh, giveaway once again for our friends at Refire Solutions for the Anderson uh, Quick Connect that we have with PowerPole. Uh, once again, the keyword was Quick Connect. And the winner, by the way, if you do win, please make sure you uh, shoot first update sound message either on our Discord or uh, here uh, in chat. Uh, first name, last name, mailing address, all that stuff. And it will take a few weeks just because of build season right now. Uh, the winner is going to be Ola Zola, 5818. Congratulations. Uh, Olazola has won the Quick Connect, uh, and Olazola's won a lot in before. So, uh, so congratulations to Olazola uh, for winning. Uh, guys, from First Updates Now, I just want to give a big thank you uh, for this fantastic uh, stream. The first Capital R3D team is by far the best we have worked with so far. This group is absolutely incredible, and we hope that you uh, enjoy the videos that we have up. We have a few more to still put up. Uh, each one will break down each of the subsystems on the robot, and then, of course, we'll be posting this video as well, too. Uh, so go check it out, youtube.com forward slash first updates now. Uh, and uh, on fun, we have shows throughout the season, including uh, for FRC. We'll have a show next uh, week, uh, Tuesday, uh, meeting with some teams talking about their build design process. We have shows for FTC as well. You can get the full schedule uh, on our Twitch page or at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tyler. And I think that's it. So, oh yeah, we got a robot. Oh name. yeah, we gotta, we we gotta find the out what the robot name, name is. Thank All you, right. Samantha. <laughs> All right, so the the name options, yeah. by the way, let's see if I can make this full screen here. One second. Uh, so right. the name options that we have, by the way, were uh, Bop Ross, uh, Bot Delphine, which I don't even know what that means, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, Boptimus Prime uh, was the other one on it. And we'll uh, we'll pull this up here and see if we can get a winner. Uh, and the winner on our stroll poll was, uh, with 50% of the vote, Bop Ross. So Ooh. Bop Ross is the winner. <laughs> so it seems like most of our R3 so team is so happy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, 
great show to everybody. Great thing. Once again, check out the archives, youtube.com forward slash first updates now. With that said, we'll see you next time on First Updates Now. Talk to you then. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and tier 2 plus subscribers on Twitch keeping fun loud, live, and independent.